Okay. Well, I think it's time to start. So thanks for joining the Federal Communications Commission's tribal webinar to discuss the upcoming application filing window for low power FM radio. We refer to that as LPFM, and this is for new station construction permits. My name is Bambi Krauss, and I'm the Chief of the Office of Native Affairs and Policy based in Washington, DC. The Federal Communications Commission is an independent federal agency responsible for implementing and enforcing America's communications laws and regulations. Through rulemakings and enforcement activities, we regulate communication service providers. Our work also includes everything from preventing unwanted calls to emergency alerts to ensuring that persons with disabilities have access to communication services and technologies. Today's webinar will provide an overview of the LPFM application filing requirements, the comparative selection process, and explain how you can apply during the open filing period of November 1 through 8 of this year. This will be the first LPFM filing window since 2013, and today's webinar is for potential applicants who are familiarizing themselves with the application process. The Office of Native Affairs and Policy is collaborating with our colleagues in the audio division of the Media Bureau. So the two main presenters today are from the audio division, and they are Jim Bradshaw, Senior Deputy Chief, and Lisa Scanlon, Deputy Division Chief. We have many other FCC staffers who assisted and are assisting with this webinar, both in, both in ONAP and in the audio division. So just uh, some helpful housekeeping items. I'll run through them fairly quickly. Uh, please use the chat function for today's webinar. The chat function is your means to ask questions and seek clarifications. We'll be reading the questions prior to answering as much as possible. And we're here to answer your questions. So I hope that we do use uh, the chat function as much as possible. Your microphones are muted and that's to uh, keep the background noise down to a minimum. And then finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our events page at a later date. So with that, Jim Bradshaw and Lisa Scanlon will lead the presentation and question and answer segment of today's webinar. So Jim. Thanks baby for that wonderful intro. It's really my pleasure to be here for, with everybody today. Uh, let me start by saying we have a, a great team of folks from the audio division here supporting me today and, and Lisa. So in addition to Lisa and myself, we have Alex Sangenis and Amy Vanderkirkhove that are participating in the webinar. Um, all four of us were involved with in the past low power from window in 2013. And, and Lisa and I have been around since the creation of the low power service back in 2000. So uh, we've got some great resources on online for you today. Hope we can answer any questions you might have. and. Uh, anything we can't answer, we can always get back to you after the fact. So let me just jump right into it. You know, what is Low Power FM? So this, this service was established in 2000 as a result of many different issues at the time. Uh, the commission was really looking for ways to get new entrants into the, the, the broadcasting community, increasing the diversity on the dial. Uh, they wanted to create new opportunities for groups looking to get into radio for the first time. And the idea was to create a service with a low barrier to entry with minimal required investments and expenses and simple rules that were easy to follow for applicants that weren't familiar with the whole uh, broadcast regulatory process. Low power FM stations are limited to 100 watts effective radiator power or ERP. This is the power that's actually transmitted from the antenna. And they provide a service radius of about 5.6 kilometers or 3.5 miles. So. Uh, you know, you're not going to be serving massive cities, but, you know, certainly towns are within reach and, you know, multiple neighborhoods can be served with low power stations. All low power stations must operate non-commercially, so they cannot run commercials, no advertising is permitted. And <clears throat> since established, the commission has had two nationwide windows for new low power stations. The first window was in 2000-2001, where we received about 3,200 applications. And the next was in 2013, where we had roughly 2,800 applications. So from those two windows, we had about 6,000 6, total applications. And currently, there are fewer than 2,000 low-power FM stations that are licensed across the country. So just, just to give some perspective, of those 6,000 applications that were submitted in the first two windows, 
almost half of them were dismissed for various reasons. So something to keep in mind as we get into the technical details as I get further down in the process. This window is really going to be a great opportunity for tribes to get into the radio business. It's only the third nationwide low power window, and we are encouraging tribes to apply if they're at all interested during this window. Keep in mind that running a low power FM station is much like running any other small business. There are lots of things to know about it before you begin. There's a lot of work that keeps in, goes into keeping the business afloat. So Lisa and I are gonna share details about what you need to do to prepare for the filing window, to submit a complete and accurate application. So you have the best chance of getting a granted construction permit and begin your journey towards operating a low power FM station that serves your community. Okay, so, so this is this slide is focusing on uh, what, what you need to do to get filed and you know get your application in the window. So let me step back a minute and provide a little more background about FCC licensing. So again, before you get a license for any type of radio station or TV station, it's, it basically works the same way. It's a two-step process. Step one is to apply for and obtain a construction permit. This is the original application that's filed by any potential licensee. Once we grant, you're assuming you're successful, and once we grant that construction permit, that allows the permit holder to start construction of the facility. Once constructed, most permit holders are allowed to start broadcasting immediately. Some have limitations on their construction permits that limit that, but basically you get your construction permit, you can build and start operating once you've complete, completed construction. Step two is to apply for a license and get a license. So during the, during the low power window, you are actually applying for the construction permit, step one in the process. So that's where this application on form 2100 schedule 30, schedule 318 is, is most helpful because this, this form is going to be, you know, your path to, to getting your initial construction permit. Uh, the, the form is referred to as the new low power FM construction permit application. There's no application filing fee for it. Um, it is all submitted electronically. I'll talk to you about that in, in the future slides. And <clears throat> absolutely, we do not take any late filings. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm still dealing with a bit of a uh, virus I've been having for the past couple of days. Um, so while the online version of the form is pretty self-explanatory, uh, if it, it's there, there's a lot to it. And uh, if you don't, if, if you'd rather deal with a paper version and get a paper version of the form, what you can do is find our FCC form page by Googling FCC form page. From that page, you can do a control F on the page and search for the form 318, number 318. Find that schedule 318 paper version that you can print out and review along with instructions to the form. If you have any questions about how any of the forms should be completed, you can do so by finding, going to the links on this page. So there are two very helpful websites that are listed on this page right now. The top is the LMS Help Center. Um, again, you can get to that site easily by Googling FCC LMS Help Center, and it will take you right to this page. And this site has absolutely everything you need to know about using our online filing systems. How do you get an account to log into it? How you actually log into it? How you start forms? Uh, how you, you know it's, anything you need to know about using our electronic filing system will be in this help center. The other link to the uh, schedule 318 instructions below. Uh, this is what we use. This is what uh, this is the form we'll use for all filings during the low power filing windows. While these two links are going to be helpful resources for you, I recommend using them in different manners. The top one, the LMS Help Center, is your kind of go to guide if you need assistance with any step of the process. On the other hand, the instructions to the Form 318 are a must read for anybody participating in the window, particularly if you're going to try to navigate the window with minimal help from broadcast experts or completely on your own. So basically, if you're not hiring a consulting engineer or you're not hiring a broadcast attorney to help you with the application process, you're definitely going to want to read those instructions from cover to cover, making sure you fully and fully understand what's going to be expected of your organization to submit the application and provide the necessary documentation. Which brings me to the next slide, preparing to file your LPFM application. So depending on your situation, you may wanna seriously consider hiring either a broadcast engineer or also a broadcast attorney to help you through this filing process. It all depends on the specifics of your, 
your location and where you're intending to apply. First thing is I wanna point out that we are not able to recommend specific engineers or attorneys that can help you with this, but I can share two organizations that have many members that are knowledgeable and experienced in both the engineering and legal arenas. So on the engineering side, we have the Association of Federal Communications Consulting Engineers. Their website is afc.org. That's afcce.org. We can provide you know, a link to that later if that would be helpful to you. Likewise, on the legal side of the fence, we have the Federal Communications Bar Association, and their website is fcba.org. So both of these groups have dozens of members that are knowledgeable in the low power fan process and can potentially help you through the through the application process if need be. If any of the following apply to you, enlisting professionals to help you with the following process is going to be an absolute must. If you're located within 50 miles of a top 50 city, uh, this, this is going to be critical that you get assistance. And this includes just about anywhere in the Northeast Corridor, Southern California, any place near Seattle, Minneapolis, Dallas, Houston, Phoenix, even Anchorage. Proximity to major urban areas is the number one determiner on whether or not you can expect competition from other applicants for your for, for your frequency. So basically, um, more population that you're located near is increases the the chances that there are going to be other applicants that are going to be competing with you for the limited frequencies that are available in your area. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, if there are, <coughs> excuse me, if there are very few channels available in your area, and I'm going to talk to you about how you find what channels are available in a few slides, but if, if there are very few channels avail available in your area, you're definitely going to want assistance in, in applying for those channels. Um, if you require a second adjacent channel waiver for the channel you propose, that too, you're going to want assistance from a broadcast engineer. I'll talk more about channel waivers in future slide too. And if you have any kind of unusual ownership or legal situation or something else requiring a waiver, any of those things most likely are going to dictate hiring an attorney to help you with the application process. So there, there are numerous reasons why you may want to list the help of an, either an engineer or an attorney. But the thing to remember is this is likely the best opportunity to obtain a low power FM station for your tribe in the next several years. The last window was in 2013. And while hiring an, an engineer or attorney may certainly cost you know, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, depending on your situation, having an expert help you through this process will mean the difference between potentially getting the station and having your application dismissed. So, um, just, just something to keep in mind. And one other thing to remember is, is noted at the end of the slide is um, getting ready to file that application early and get it into the window as soon as possible. Uh, if, if you're interested in filing and you haven't done so already, you should immediately get in, go ahead and start preparing your application as soon as possible, which takes me to the next slide. Um, so in order to even begin the application process in our system, you have to first obtain an FRN or an FCC registration number. An F FCC registration number is a 10 digit number identifying that it's a 10 digit identifying number that's assigned to entities doing business with the FCC. Uh, we use FRN numbers across the agency for many different purposes. In order to obtain an FRN, you'll need two things at a minimum. Number one, your email address. And number two, you're either going to need your IRS employer ID number or someone's social security number that's a member of your organization. Either one is used for the basis for any FRN. So obtaining an FRN is basically a two-step process. Number one, you create an account. If you go to this website for the uh, FCC course system that's listed there, you go there, you click on create an account, and then Number two, you register for an FRN with that, within the account using your employer ID number or social security number. So once you navigate to this course page that's listed on the site here, you click on the register button, which starts the registration process. And handling the creation of the account takes a couple minutes, maybe five minutes at most. Um, and then the FCC will send you an email to confirm that your email address is indeed valid and you can verify that. Once you click on the confirmation link, 
you can then log into the account. After logging into the account, you'll be there will be a button that says go to cores, which allows you to register a new FRN. And there again, registering a new FRN takes another three to four minutes to complete the necessary information. So it's that, that is the initial part of getting into our systems, um, which then brings us to the system for filing the applications, which is we call LMS, so the licensing management system. If you need, here's the link is provided on the page here as far as how to get to LMS. Uh, if you don't work well with lengthy links like that, you can always Google FCC LMS login, and it will take you right to the same page. In order to log into LMS, you have to use your FRN and you log in with your FRN and password. Once you're in, you can click on the button that says file a new app, file an application. And then the option for a new low power FM station construction permit will be there that you can choose. Okay, so as you start to get into the application, you're going to realize that you need some critical technical information to complete the application. We have created a tool to help you find channels that may be available in your areas. So you can use, it's called the LPFM Channel Finder, um, much like the other things. If you don't work well with the, with the web addresses that are provided here, you can do a Google search for FCC Low Power FM Channel Finder. It will take you right to this page. You use the Channel Finder to determine channels and frequencies that are available in your area. Uh, we we use the term channel and frequency interchangeably. Most of you are going to know these things by frequencies. In order to use the channel finder, you need to know the coordinates for where you want to locate your tower. Uh, the easiest way to find your coordinates is by using Google Maps. You, know, you can go to Google Maps, uh, pull up your location on, on the map itself, zoom in where you want to you know, find your tower location that you care to locate. And you right click on that location on the map and it will provide you with the actual coordinates in decimal form for that location. So these, these decimal coordinates can then be entered into the channel finder page to help you tentatively find channels that are available in your area. It can also help determine if you may want to enlist the help from an engineering consultant. So basically, if you run the channel finder, it presents you, presents you with very few channels, either you're just a handful of channels or no available channels means your area likely is very well served by other stations. With few channels available, you're definitely going to want to get consulting help with preparing the application, just because the assumption is in areas where there are few channels, there's going to be competition for those channels uh, for folks that may want to apply for them. Um, and if there are no available channels that are located on the channel finder, you may be able to propose a different site to see if moving moving sites changes the channel availability. So just because there's not something available at your precise location that you're interested in, you may be able to you know, move down the street or to some other location that you have access to where you could actually construct a tower and still serve the basic area you're looking to serve. The channel finder also tells you about the following issues that may be of concern in your area. Uh, the location of nearby AM towers, your proximity to Canada or Mexico, uh, proximity to other facilities that require specific protections, such as um, specific FCC monitoring stations, or other things that come into play when preparing an application for the low power application for the low power station. Okay, so technical parameters. This Applicants must specify the channel and antenna location coordinates in the channel and facility information part of the form, and also the antenna location sections of the form. So these are these are crucial technical components. So basically, your location, your channel, and your antenna height that you propose in your application are you know, the most critical factors that come into determining if your station is going to actually be able to be potentially granted. So uh, that's that's why these factors are most important as far as determining what you want to apply for. The things we look at when applications are submitted. So somebody will file a an application for a particular location and request a specific channel and height that they want to locate 
it's important based on our rules that those channel and locations that are proposed protect all nearby FM stations. You have to also protect existing applications that were filed prior to July 31st of 2023. Um, and all these other stations that are listed here on this page must be protected, which is why um, this, this is potentially the most important part of the application is just ensuring that all of these other nearby stations and considerations are are taken into account when submitting an application. So again, a very good reason to consider enlisting the help of a consulting engineer and preparing an application. Okay, so so assuming you've chosen a site where you want to propose this low power facility um you've determined you know a channel that may work or a couple of channels that may work uh, it's it's critical that the location and channel that's selected protects all minimum separation requirements of nearby authorizations and applications any applications that have defects that fail to protect the nearby stations Will potentially be dismissed with no opportunity to correct the defect. Uh, something to keep in mind too is in applicants that propose facilities in um, areas that require the protection of second adjacent stations, uh, there is the opportunity to request a waiver of the second adjacent protection requirements, um, but any such waiver must demonstrate that the proposal will not cause any interference to any of those second adjacent stations that may be nearby and any applicant proposing such a waiver must include an exhibit with the application that clearly demonstrates the lack of interference and this is this is important when we get to your application and review the specifics of it uh just to ensure that any nearby stations are properly protected and and will will not be receiving any interference. So one other important matter to keep in mind when proposing a site is if you do not actually own the site that you're proposing to operate from, you must have reasonable assurance at the time of filing that a specific site will be available for construction and you can actually operate your facilities from this location for a given time. So the form itself has a question on there that uh, requires you to certify that you have the site assurance and also requires you to provide the name of the person contacted to verify the site availability so they so we can ensure that uh, you actually do have the ability to use that site um, when you initially construct and, and operate the station and here again a failure to obtain this site assurance from the site owner can result in dismissal of the application and it's such a defect is not a correctable defect. Um, so I've covered a lot of materials as far as you know, getting ready on the technical side of thing to prepare your application. Now I'm going to hand it off to Lisa Scanlon. She's the deputy chief of the audio division, where she's going to talk about some of the more legal requirements as far as uh, being eligible to apply during the window. But first. Um, just a couple things I wanted to mention that are essential to, to preparing your LPFM application. Uh, the, the commission released a public notice in July of 2023 on July 31st. Uh, we refer to it the procedures public notice. Uh, there are a lot of incredibly helpful requirements that are listed in that public notice that uh, you definitely want to check into. Um, again, I if you haven't done so already you want to make sure you look through the complete instructions for the form 318 schedule 318 to make sure uh, you fully understand all those requirements and some of the other things that may be required of you obviously if you're going to apply it's obtaining an fcc registration number um and just to just to get ready to step into the lms system and look at your application and get get that going so with that, I will hand it off to Lisa to talk about the legal requirements for filing in the window. Thank you, Jim. Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Scanlon from the Audio Division. Uh, joining me today, as Jim mentioned, 
um, are Amy Vanderkerkhoff and Alex Sanginis. And I think Tom Nessinger is also, he's not presenting, but I think he's also online. Um, this is a team to help answer questions. And of course, they're going to chime in and correct me if I go off track anywhere on my presentation. Um, basically, I'm going to give a high level overview of the LPFM, the eligibility requirements, and discuss what sort of supporting documentation is needed in connection with particular form responses. I'm also going to describe the selection process that we use in the audio division that we use to compare competing applications. So um, as Jim was mentioning in the history of the LPFM service back to 2000, um, the LPM service is, is unique among our radio services as it's reserved solely for nonprofit and local organizations. Therefore, uh, throughout the years and the various orders that the commission has um, released, uh, the commission has stated that only the following entities, the following three entities are eligible to file an application uh, to receive an LPFM station. The first is a nonprofit educational organization. The second is a tribe or a tribally controlled entity. And the third is a state or local government or a non-governmental entity that's going to provide a non-commercial public radio service. In other words, no individuals can come in and apply for an LPFM station. And with respect to all three of these entity types, all of them must qualify as local. So how many applications can be filed in the window? Well, the answer depends on which type of entity the applicant is. So for uh, type number one, our nonprofit educational organizations, they can only file one application in the window. Tribal applicants can file two applications in the window. And applicants providing public safety radio services, they can file multiple applications with the caveat that they have to designate one of those multiple applications as their priority application. And what happens is the Bureau will dismiss any non-priority applications if uh, there are any competing applications with those applications. As Jim discussed earlier, the applicants come in and file a Schedule 318 um, in, in the filing window, and that's the LPFM construction permit application. I want to clarify something that Jim said. In, on the FCC's main web page, on our forms page, the old legacy application that we used before we used LMS is, is listed as Form 318. However, since these applications are going to be filed in LMS, you have to find the Schedule 2100 comma Schedule 318. And that's the new and improved uh, LPFM uh, construction permit application that we put together just specifically for this window. Now, this particular form is, um, is, is the Schedule 8 318 is a certification based format. But for certain of the questions, and certainly, certainly for the uh, points claims, supporting documentation is required. So it's important that the applicants carefully read the application and especially the form instructions and that July 31st procedures public notice to make sure that you include all the required supporting documentation that's relevant and called for for the particular question that you're answering because it's the applicant that bears the full responsibility for com submitting a complete and timely application. So all the applicants for LPFM stations must certify as to basic eligibility requirements. There's two uh, certifications that are important and I'm gonna focus on. The first one is the applicant has to certify that it is local. The second, is the applicant must certify its eligibility to own and operate an LPFM station. And for this particular eligibility certification, the structure of the form requires each applicant that it, uh, to certify that it falls into one of those three eligible categories that I talked about earlier. Again, it's, um, I'm either a nonprofit educational organization, 
I'm a tribe or a tribal organization, or I'm a, a state or local government offering, uh, proposing to offer a public safety radio service. So each applicant has to submit explanatory exhibits or exhibits, depending on which category of uh, organization you fall under. So as far as the uh, certification that I am local, how does an applicant qualify as a quote, local organization? First of all, this is a rule-based requirement and the particular rule at issue here is at the bottom of the screen, 47 CFR section 73.853B um, spells all this out, all the information that you see on the screen spells it out in that particular rule certification or that particular rule. Um, so regarding the local certification qualifications, um, it's, it's again, based on the, the qualifications themselves vary to pace, based on what applicant type you are. So to qualify as local, the first group, those, um, the educational, uh, the uh, nonprofit educational organizations, they must either be physically headquartered or have a campus or have 75% of their board members residing within 10 miles for applicants in the top 50 markets or 20 miles for applicants outside the top 50 urban markets of the transmitting antenna site proposed in that application. For a tribal applicant to meet the local requirements, it must be a tribe or a tribal organization and have its tribal lands within the service area of the proposed LPFM station. For a state or local government applicant proposing its public safety radio service, it must have jurisdiction within the service area of the proposed station. Again, all the specifics of this is, are spelled out in that particular rule section. In addition, LPFM applicants have to certify that they are eligible to own and operate an LPFM station. For this form certification, documentation is definitely required. Again, each applicant type submits different forms of documentation. So let's go through the three applicant types and we'll go through the different documentation that's required for each particular type. So for your nonprofit educational organizations, the applicant has to provide documentation showing that it is educational and it is a nonprofit. Specifically, the applicant has to submit an attachment to the application showing that it has an educational objective and that the LPFM station will be used for the advancement of an educational program. That's in the first bullet up there. And that's what the in narrative form, the applicant has to come in with an, at, an attachment describing its educational objective, and it will be used for the advancement of its own unique individual act, educational program. Second, the applicant has to provide a detailed description of the nature of the proposed station programming, and if at all possible, provide us with program schedules. And for um, these applicants, uh, they, they must also submit uh, complete copies of the of their documents establishing that they are nonprofit entities, such as a corporate charter or its particular articles of incorporation. Also, applicants that are accredited by a State Department of Education or recognized by an accrediting organization should identify, identify that particular accrediting entity. The second entity type, of course, is our tribes and our tribal organizations. For the LPFM context, the definition, a, a tribe is defined in the rules. And those rules that are not don't appear on the screen, but the particular rules at issue are 73.853C and 73.7000. That's the definition of a tribe. A tribe, as you can see in the first bullet, is defined as 
any Indian or Alaskan Native tribe, band, nation, Pueblo, village, or community that is recognized by the federal government. A tribal organization is defined as a private nonprofit entity, such as a nonprofit foundation, corporation, or association that is 51% or more that is owned or controlled by a tribe or tribes. To establish eligibility, a tribal applicant has to provide a detailed description of the non-commercial nature of the proposed station's programming, and again, if possible, provide us with program schedule. If an applicant's a tribal organization, the applicant must come in and describe and explain which tribe owns or controls it, and also submit complete copies of documents establishing its nonprofit status, such as corporate charters or its articles of incorporation. Now, state and local governments and non-government entities may be eligible for LPFM stations because they're proposing to provide public safety radio services. For, for those uh, types of entities uh, to, to uh, qualify, the applicants must not be organized for profit and they must uh, pledge to use the proposed station for uh, public safety radio services to protect the life, health, property, and services, and it must not be made commercially available to the public. For applicants uh, who are non-governmental entities, they have to submit complete copies of the documents establishing their nonprofit status, such as a corporate charter or an article of incorporation. Again, these procedures are all spelled out in the procedures public notice, and they're also explicitly spelled out in the instructions to the Schedule 318. Uh, Lisa, could I interrupt you for a second? Hi, Tom. <laughs> Hi. Uh, this is actually a question that came in on the chat, and it has to do with what you've just gone over. Uh, the, app, the, uh, the attendee was asking if they already have an LPF, if they're a tribal advocate, they have an LPFM station already and they're applying for a second one, can they skip the educational program exhibit and just certify that the proposed station will advance a program similar to the one that the commission already found qualifying for their existing LPFM station? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call on my helpers. Uh, Amy, are you there? Have you ever seen anything like that before? And what what have, what are the documents that we require? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so you can you can reference the the past application that was that that was granted, and I would reference that. But I'd also put an explanation about what your proposed program is is for the new station as well. But and, that that and, is a, to reference the. The past to qualify. Well, probably would be helpful to reference if you're going if we're going to allow such a thing to come in and, and serve for its educational purpose. Um, I, I would probably uh, make sure you reference the file number of the previous application where we granted the application, and therefore approved the uh, the, the the previous showing. Okay. Okay, next slide, Jim, thank you. Um, so now getting into the, uh, the our, our process of resolution here. So how do we compare the applications that we do receive in the window? Um, conflicting applications, which cannot all be granted with our technical rules, we call them mutual exclusive applications or in our parlance, MX applications. So the essence of the process is the first thing we do after the window closes is it's usually Jim's team that does this is first step we take after window closes is to define or to bundle our MX groups of applications. Uh, MX, is, uh, MX groups are then compared using our point system. Again, the point system is rule defined. Uh, if the MX applications do proceed to a point system analysis, what we do is the, uh, the staff, we review the point submissions that were submitted on the Schedule 318, and we compare the MX applications and then tentatively select the applicant 
with the highest point total from each MX group. So with that in mind, that's an overview of the process. So with that in mind, let's dive in and get an overview of the LPFM point system. In a nutshell, so each applicant has to complete the point system factor slash tiebreaker section in the Schedule 318. If the applicants are determined to be MX, the commission, we, the staff, reviews the point submissions to compare the applicants and tentatively select an application for grant. Now, it's important um, because we, uh, we have a filing window. So the, the qualifications for points are determined as of the closing date of the LPFM filing window. And this in the, for this particular window, it's November 8th, 2023. And so that's our snapshot date for determining point eligibility. So there's six criteria criterion in the uh, in our point system. And the point system is a what we call a paper hearing. So each one of those uh, points is in the following six bullets. Point number one: established community presence of at least two years. And by the way, I'll go into each one of these. Uh, points individually and, and describe what needs to be submitted as far as documentation if the applicant's going to be claiming one of those points. So point number one, established community presence of at least two years. Point two, commitment to originate local programming, eight hours per day. Point three is uh, a commitment to maintain a, a, a main studio. Point four, is our bonus point, and that's a commitment to originate both local programming and maintain a main studio. Point five is diversity of ownership, and point six is a tribal applicant that's proposing to locate its transmitting antenna site on its tribal lands. So now let's look at each one of these uh, six criteria and review what specific documentation is needed to support those individual point claims. So merit point number one, the commission awards one point to an applicant that has an a quote established community presence. Uh, to qualify for this point, uh, again, it depends on what particular type of entity is claiming this particular point. So a nonprofit educational organization, in order to qualify this point, must certify that during the two years prior to filing the application, it has existed as a nonprofit educational organization. And number two, it's been physically headquartered or had a campus, or has had 75% of its governing board members residing within 10 miles, uh, if in the top 50 or 20 miles, if in outside the top 50 urban markets of the coordinates of the proposed transmitting antenna site. Applicants claiming this point have to submit evidence of its qualifications in an exhibit to the application. Specifically, they have to demonstrate that the date that they commenced their existence, and they have to give the location of the applicant's headquarters, campus, or governing board members' residences during those two years prior to filing. For our public safety radio applicants, if they claim the point, they have to certify that during the two years prior to the application filing, it had jurisdiction within the service area of the proposed LPFM station. A tribal applicant must certify that it is a qualifying tribe and that its tribal lands are within the service area of the proposed LPFM station. Note here that tribal organizations that were created by a tribe in order to apply for the LPFM construction permits are not required to have been in existence for two years, unlike their counterpart nonprofit educational organizations. Merit point number two is local programming origination. The commission awards one point to an applicant that pledges to originate locally at least eight hours of programming per day. And locally originating programming is produced by the license within 10 miles of the coordinates of the proposed transmitting antenna site. Programming can, can include call-in shows, music, selected played by a DJ, 
broadcast of events at local schools, broadcast of, of musical performances at a, at a festival or at a local studio. Merit point number three is the main studio point. The commission awards one point to an applicant that pledges to maintain a publicly accessible main studio that has local origination capability, can be reached by phone, and importantly is staffed at least 20 hours a week between 7 and 10 p.m., 7 a.m. and 10 p.m., and is located, the main studio is located within 10 miles of the proposed station's transmitting antenna site. Applicants are required to document in the form, they have to specify the proposed address and the telephone number for the proposed main studio in order to be awarded that point. Point number four, the bonus point, uh, the commission awards one point to an applicant that certifies that it qualifies for both local pro program origination and the main studio criteria. Point number five, the commission awards one point for diversity of ownership if the applicant certifies on the form that it holds no attributable interest in any other broadcast station. We, other, we often call this our new entrant point. If the applicant does have an interest in another broadcast station, it can still qualify for the point if it pledges to divest all of its existing media interest. And it must submit that pledge to divest and list the other stations that it owns within an exhibit to the application. Point number six, the commission awards one point to a tribal applicant that proposes to locate its transmitting antenna site on its tribal lands. Tribal lands are defined in the rules at 73.7 thousand and includes both reservations and near reservation lands. So as you can see, as I went through all the requirements and the documentation that is, uh, needs to be submitted to support your certifications, the, documenta the documentation is important to our application and comparative process. So this slide provides a couple of helpful tips regarding the documentation process. Tip number one, the point claims and the certifications must be easily ascertainable from the exhibits from, that are uh, filed with the application. Tip number two, we will not credit certifications where the applicant's required to submit documentation, but oops, it forgot to submit any support, a timely documentation. We won't submit a bare certificate. We won't credit a bare certification. Tip number three, we will not consider documentation to claim, to support a claim point if it comes in late after the November 8th filing deadline, if it comes in in the form of amendment. So the moral of the story is please carefully review all your supporting documentation thoroughly before you file it with us. So what happens after the window closes? So the next couple of slides are going to be a brief overview of what the staff does once the window closes, what we do with those applications. So after the window closes, we, gym staff, usually the technical staff reviews first, they examine the applications. And it may be that some of the applications are not annexed with any other applications that came in during the filing window. We call these singleton applications. So what the engineering staff does and the legal staff is we review the application for compliance with all of the relevant technical and legal reviews. Um, if, they're in, if the application, the singleton application is compliant with all the technical and legal rules, we accept it for filing and put it out on an accepted for filing public notice. If we find that an application, a singleton application is not in compliance with a technical or legal rule, we give it one opportunity, we dismiss it, but we give it one opportunity to file a minor curative amendment and submit a petition for reconsideration. The incoming amendment to fix the problem must propose, uh, must be a minor change amendment and it must comply with all the relevant rules. Applications uh, 
and I'm sorry, amendments and petitions for recon where they have been dismissed must be filed within 30 days of that dismissal public notice. Next step, after the window closes um, and we look at the Singleton applications, we will also be releasing a public notice announcing the MX applications or the MX groups and the applications within said MX group. Um, but after we announce that, pub, uh, put out that MX public notice, the applicants don't go directly to points analysis. Rather, all applicants that are MX, all of them have an opportunity to resolve their conflicts with other members of their, in their MX group through a technical amendment, a settlement agreement, or a time-sharing agreement. So what we do is we put out a public notice, we release a public notice announcing the groups and announcing a time for filing such, uh, announcing a time frame for submitting the settlements or the technical amendments or the time-sharing agreements. Then and only then if the conflict remains, the commission will use the point system to tentatively select the application from each, from each MX group for grant. Technical applications, tentatively selected applications from the MX groups with defects, just like their singleton brethren will also be dismissed, but they will get one opportunity to file within 30 days of dismissal, an amendment and a petition for, reconsider, a petition for reconsideration. Tentatively selected applications that comply with all the rules will be accepted for filing. Um, the next slide is uh, just a reminder. Uh, once an application is uh, accepted for filing, the applicant must give local public notice of, of the application's existence. This is done in one of two ways either on the station website or a website that's affiliated with the station, the applicant or the applicant's parent entity, or provide public notice on local public notice on a publicly accessible, locally targeted website. The, the rules, this is an extremely complicated rule section, which we recently revived in the last, since the last LPFM filing window, is in section 733580. Um, Tom Nessinger, who uh, piped in earlier, is was the author of that rulemaking, and you can contact Tom if you have any questions about uh, providing local public notice once your application is accepted for filing. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Mr. Bradshaw to recap, once again, our help resources for LPFM applicants. Jim? Thanks, Lisa, for all those details. Um, so yes, just to wrap things up, I just wanted to provide links to all the relevant resources that we've referenced during the presentation, the Help Center, the Channel Finder, the instructions for the Schedule 318, which are probably going to be the most important thing you want to look at here. Uh, there's also a link here to the LMS data entry, the login page. Uh, if you have any issues, when you're logged into LMS and it's not cooperating, here, here's uh, information for accessing the help desk. There's a toll-free number. Uh, there's also a link here where you can submit an online request for assistance uh, directly to the help desk that way. And then lastly is the page for obtaining your FRN and getting a login to log into the LMS system. So with that, we'd like to open it up to see if anybody has any questions that we can answer for them while we're on the webinar. All right, Jim, we actually have uh, one technical question. So why don't we start with that one? Okay. Um, and is what is the radius of the coordinates for the channel finder? In other words, what is the search distance for an available channel and how often is the channel finder updated? So this, this is a good question. So the, the channel finder is actually updated um, on a daily basis on our end. So if there's anything that needs to be protected in there, that we update our database to properly reflect 
um, you know, the change status. If there's a new station that has to be protected or a station that changes channels, um, we have to update that data behind the scenes. So it's automatically taken into account when somebody uses a channel finder. As far as the radius is concerned, um, so this, the channel finder looks specifically at the coordinates that the applicant proposes or the applicant keys into the system and only looks to see what channels are available at that particular location. So, um, you know, something could be available at your precise address where you're proposing, but you could go, uh, you know, 200 yards down the street and you get a slightly different answer just because you've moved far enough away from an existing station that you're now protecting them where you weren't protecting them before. So um, it, it doesn't actually look to see that there are other options that may be available. And that's why it is helpful. You know, if you, if you use a channel finder and it indicates that there are no channels available or very few channels available, it may be worth looking at different sites in the area, you know, around your particular location, just to see if that may provide any different results. Cause you know, particularly for those people that are maybe not in a metro market, but they're in the fringe areas outside a metro market, you know, moving away from the metro market may provide more channel of availability. Um, and that's why using the channel finder, you know, experimenting with different locations in your area that would be feasible for you to use and in which you could actually obtain site availability certification um it, it's it's worth using the channel finder to, to try and investigate those options all right um and we have another question which is what are the operating hours of an lpfm and is the on-air programming the same number of hours as the operating hours um so i i'll start with that and if lisa or jim want to add anything so uh, the minimum operating hours for an LPFM are stated in Section 73850 of the rules, and it states that LPFMs are required to operate at least 36 hours per week, which consists of at least five hours of operation during the day and uh, six days of the week. And then there's some uh, exceptions for um, stations that are licensed educational institutions like colleges and high school. Uh, looking back at the local program origination, that was at least eight hours per day. So if, if you're operating uh, eight hours per day in order to uh, get the point, uh, you pretty much kind of by default complied with the rules. And and it's remember that that, that there's uh, 73850 sets the minimum threshold for all LPFMs, regardless of whether they qualify for the point or not. The point is a separate issue. I don't have anything to add to that. The only thing that I would add in, in that same rule section that, that Alex pointed to, 73.850, um, there's also an intro language that says LPFM stations will be licensed for unlimited time operation except those that are operating under a share time agreement. So mm -hmm. what Alex um, listed was the minimum operating requirement. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, this is Bambi, just to encourage people who have questions, this is a good time to post them in chat. And I want to make sure the very first question was answered. I'm sorry if I missed it. I had to step away for a minute or two. Uh, yes, we we addressed that one regarding okay. the uh, exhibits and the applications. Great. And also the uh, the public notice that we put on our website does provide all of our phone numbers and email addresses. Uh, if you have a question that's like very um, like fact specific, like I have this issue with this issue and that issue. Uh, it might be easier just to send us the email. Uh, we do actually try to, uh, you know, do like a little research and, you know, we, we like to give you a good thorough response, not just uh, give a quick off the cuff answer. We, we do want to be helpful in this process. So uh, email is probably the easiest way to reach us just so that way we can collaborate internally and discuss among ourselves and make sure we're getting you the best possible information. Well, 
Well, we have a, a couple minutes in case people come up with um, additional questions. Uh, what is what generally takes the longest in filling out this application? Would you say, or is it just the overall learning a new system, or is there anything that people can do to speed along their application? Uh, well, I've never filled one out personally. Um, I, I do think, you know, kind of going back to what Jim said earlier, the the most critical and difficult section is probably the engineering aspects, which is why we really encourage applicants to uh, to, to retain a professional broadcast engineer. It's also just uh, a very easy area to, to make a mistake on. Um, you know, I, I unfortunately last year we had quite a few, or excuse me, last uh, window, we did have applicants that stumbled on the issue of spacing and the spacing waivers. Uh, you know, Jim mentioned the second adjacent waiver, which was something that uh, it was a big issue for, for LPFMs in particular. Uh, that waiver has to be included in the original application as filed. And if not, we, we have to dismiss without the ability to reinstate. So, you know, really pay attention to those engineering details. Uh, I also think it's important to, uh, I, I know it sounds, you know, kind of silly, but really do go back and and reread the application one more time, um, you know, but to take a nap, print out a cup of coffee, uh, or, you know, get, take a nap, have a cup of coffee, don't print one out, uh, just to go back and make sure you've kind of looked it all over with a fresh uh, set of eyes. Every now and then we get people who who put in, you know, the wrong coordinates. Uh, occasionally someone has identified a tower site in the middle of the ocean or on another continent. You know, those are mistakes that, you know, when, when you're rushing, uh, mistakes get made. So, you know, save the draft, step away from the computer for a few minutes and come back and then finish it. It would be a suggestion that I would give people. I absolutely agree with that. I would, two things I would specifically point out are double, triple checking the coordinates you use on the application mm -hmm. and also the channel that's entered because we've seen many mistakes made with just mm -hmm. simple typos made where people entered the wrong coordinates or they transpose numbers um sometimes that can result in a dismissal that it can't be rectified it can't be resolved so uh it's it's critically important just to double check that information after you've submitted it mm -hmm. after you've after you've entered it after you've entered it and i would and, add and that the most helpful thing that that you can do is is um print out a copy of the Schedule 318 instructions. We go question by question in the instructions, section by section of the form and 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 lay out in, in gory detail what, what needs to be submitted um, and and where you can go for help um, to, to, to help fill out the form. So the instructions are key. All right, and another point that Jim mentioned earlier in his discussion is uh, start the process early, and if you have questions, reach out to us early. You know, but please don't wait until you know four o'clock on the day the window closes to to start calling. Uh, you, the chances you're going to get uh, the help you need, you know, to diminish quickly in the day. Uh, so please call early. You know, our, our phones and our emails are open. Um, sorry, I just kicked my table, uh, but the, definitely you know, start the process early and. I mean, just kind of honestly, like just the comments and things. Don't save it for the last minute. We got Very a new point. question posted, but thank you for all that. Mm -hmm. Okay, the question is, how long is the construction permit or when does it expire? Uh, the construction permit expires, and we just tweak this to make sure, uh, three years after the day it is granted. That's correct. Yes, and you must file the covering license application uh, before it expires. So it's just, just building the station alone does not complete the construction process. You must file that covering license application. I want to chime in that the three-year build-out requirement for the construction permit is a, a new feature for mm -hmm. this window. Uh, we changed the, uh, the, the, the rules since the last uh, LPFM window. So they have a three-year term as as just just like their uh, full service FM construction permits. Right. It used to be eighteen months. Right. Big big benefit for 
permittees there. Yes. Any other questions? Well, I really appreciate your time and this has been really helpful. Well, thank you. We're, we're glad to do this. And like I mentioned earlier, this is a, a really great opportunity for folks that are looking to get into the business and and uh, start start operating a station to serve their community. So uh, please take advantage of it if you can and uh, get those applications started early and, and submit it early in the window if you're going to file. Don't don't wait to the last minute. So thanks for joining us from from all of us in the audio division. And um, don't hesitate to send us any emails if you have any follow-up questions. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, all. Bye. Bye. Bye.